please welcome People's Strategy Principal, Christine Coogan. So as we sort of reconvene here after that break, it's going to be a tough act to follow between Shane and Tim. We've heard some really exciting insights this morning. And I brought some of my friends with me to talk a little bit about talent, which is one of the topics that I would say we hear a lot about across all functions, all types of businesses. There's a lot of concern around getting the right talent, being able to hire effectively, being able to be prepared for the future and be resilient. And so we're gonna talk a lot about those types of things today. Um, as a partner in our people's strategy practice, I help our clients deal with workforce and talent issues, but especially using data and analytics. We're gonna talk a little bit about how data could be HR's friend when it comes to addressing some of these talent issues. Um, we're in a really challenging labor market. It is the first time we've ever seen five generations participating in the workforce at the same time. We are facing some unprecedented skill gaps as the pace of innovation increases, automation. We're also seeing a declining workforce, as Tim said, and how are we going to address the, the decrease in population and the lower workforce base we're going to have over time? And what are we going to do about some of the employee expectations and the, ch the desire to change the employment relationship that our employees have. So we will talk about all these things. Uh, I hope uh, my counterparts here will share with us some insights that we can bring back to our organizations and hopefully begin to start solving and working on these. So I'd like to introduce um, Amy Bope, who's the CHRO of Kelly Services. Kelly Services' impact on the labor market is significant. They connect 370,000 people globally to organizations who need all types of talent. Um, and Amy also oversees 7,000 people internally to Kelly Services who support those operations. And I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Bree Lumley, a managing director in our human capital advisory practice. Bree works with Fortune 100 companies across all different types of industries globally to address their talent challenges. And one thing I wanna note here at the beginning is that a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is centered around knowledge workers. Um, those are the types of folks that you would typically see in your finance organizations. But it's important to know there are many different types of workers in the workforce. And so we may touch on some of the different types of needs across these workers. But I would say predominantly our comments will apply to knowledge workers. Since we're following Tim, I feel like we can make a comment around the labor economy or the economic market that underlies the hiring, the development of talent, which is, it is an incredibly inefficient market by economic standards. So what does that mean? Um, efficient markets have things like transparency and supply and demand. Um, the labor market does not have that, right? As a job seeker, you couldn't see all the jobs available, and as a hirer, you can't see all the people who are looking for jobs, so there's no transparency. There's no um, agreement on pricing. We don't talk about pricing when we're talking about hiring until much later, and we do it on an individual basis. So um, there's not a lot of transparency. There's difficulty in measuring things. We can't measure people the same way we measure physical goods by weight or volume, or um, you know, we don't have the same ability to take skills and break them down objectively, right? Um, and so it's, a, it's an inefficient market that we operate in, and Following Tim, right, inefficient markets create suboptimal matches. So within the US, 66 million jobs are filled every year. 95% of those are backfill. They're not new jobs. They're jobs we're filling because we've created matches that are unsuccessful. And so when we think about the scale of this issue, it is absolutely massive. And you can make a really significant impact on your organizations if you can make better matches hire better, um, and develop people better to be prepared for uh, your workplace of the future. So we're gonna touch on a lot of that. Um, this next slide is one that often gets me kicked out of HR conversations, <laughs> um, because if you've tried to hire in your organizations, you know our hiring processes, we all do these things, so it's a safe space, um, but 
we all do things that make it more difficult to hire. I'm curious, Amy, which of these sort of resonate with you, both in your organization and with the companies you partner with? Well, thank you. And um, when we were preparing this session, I said we could spend the entire hour just on the slide. Because if we could um, make significant improvements here, it would be transformational from a financial impact and business productivity perspective. But when I think about all of these elements, the one I focus on most is making sure that we're taking the time to hire the right person at the right level. And there's a number of components I think about in that space. The first one is don't just post the role as soon as it becomes vacant. And we all have that, that sort of that energy to do it quickly, um, but that's, that's a false start in my experience. Taking the time, if you're a leader or if you're the finance partner, to talk through the, you know, the current composition of your team and also the broader team's perspective. Um, going outside, we saw in our data at Kelly, for the first time in as long as we've tracked the data, we're actually paying more to hire that external talent than we are to develop it from it within. And so it really gave, gave us pause to make sure we're doubling down on our internal mobility. Um, but that, for me, that's probably the first place I'd start. Absolutely. Um, one that stands out for me is that resumes do not predict success. So leaning back on a couple of data points for a second, um, we look at resumes and we look at job descriptions. And in separately or, or together, they don't predict candidate success. So if you have a lot of matches between the words on the resume and the words in the job description, it doesn't mean you've hired successfully. And that should hopefully scare you all because resumes are the primary way that we screen candidates. In fact, we do it in an automated way in a lot of our organizations. So um, to know that the primary basis for assessing candidate, or at least gatekeeping at the front of the process, is not predictive of success is a little bit challenging. For you, which of these stands out for you? <clears throat> yeah, well, ghost, I mean, ghosting makes me smile. It makes me laugh because you know we all have heard the term as it relates to dating experiences or friendships, but um, you know, in a candidate process, you know, I think as someone in the business, you think of, okay, I haven't heard from that candidate, what happened? But really, we also need to be thinking about it from the opposite perspective. So how are we treating our candidates and what is their experience or journey like as they're interacting with us, as they go through their many, sometimes you know, up to eight, 10 interviews? Is that process streamlined and are we following up? Oftentimes there's a lot of back-end processes that we can't change with our company. Like there's you know, risk processes, background checks, et cetera, and the candidate feels like they're left hanging. And so it sometimes it just takes a small change, um, even if it's you, know, you or your colleagues reaching out, more, more of that humanistic touch to the process that really makes a big impact. So um, we've been coaching our clients to really try and match you know, very high potential candidates with people in the business and do small follow-ups. Just say, hey, you know, running this background check, it should be a couple weeks. Or you know, if you know things about the candidate, like you know that they're going on a trip soon. Hey, how was that trip? Just letting you know that we're still interested and this process is continuing. Could, could I add something to that? Of course. Um, one of the ways that helped me reshape the, that candidate experience was to stop thinking about them as a future worker because if they were not the right match, you would sit, you know, sort of quickly sort of um, um, shelf them. But if you think about them as a future client or a future customer, and what is going to be their memory of their experience with your recruiting space, you don't know 10, 20 years from now, if they had a fantastic experience, they might say, hey, let's put KPMG on that job or let's, let's look at it. Yeah, and, and we saw that example, Brie, from Virgin, right? Virgin yeah, Mobile? Absolutely, yeah. So there's this case of Virgin where potential candidates were not hearing back from Virgin and in fact had very negative experiences with them. And so in return, they didn't want to you know, use their services. So it, it very much impacts wider than just you and your potential candidate, it can often impact the broader business. So, you know, be cautious and be aware of how you're interacting with people because it can um, disrupt your business. Yeah, and in the case of Virgin Mobile, I think they calculated that they were losing um, customers at a cost of five million dollars a year, or five million pounds a year, I should say, 
um, because of poor, directly tied to poor candidate experiences, that, that those people were going through the process, it wasn't successful or it wasn't, um, wasn't enjoyable for them, and then they were within six months canceling and that was costing them $5 million a year, and then they were going out and telling other people to cancel too. <laughs> so the compounding effect of a poor candidate experience can be really material to a business. Um, the other one that I just want to mention that um, sometimes um, sort of people um, are surprised by is that referrals aren't always better. So a lot of times we ha when we want to hire, we say to our team, who do you know? Who's in the market, right? Like we've all done it to say, hey, we need to fill a position. Who do you know? And one of the problems with referrals is that, um, first of all, they decrease diversity. We tend to spend time in groups that look like us, that have, have gone to the same colleges or live in the same communities. So referrals can decrease diversity within teams. Um, also, what's interesting about referrals is that when you study them, they're not better fits. What they actually have is someone looking out for them inside the organization. So if you take that person away, for example, the person who referred them quits before they start, that candidate is just as successful as anyone else you might hire. If you do the opposite, you put someone in place and you incentivize them to help that person be successful, you can replicate the success of referrals simply by having a, a solid coach who has you know, invested interest in their success. So um, really rethinking how referrals work or how we want to think about referrals is important because it's an important pipeline that I think is maybe overused. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, we have done a number of studies at KPMG around employees and CEOs, business leaders, and one of the things that we have found across these studies is there's a big gap between what employees want and what employers want. And so I'm curious, Amy, these are some of the areas we've identified as significant gaps. Which of these stand out to you? They're all powerful. I think the one I'd like to focus on, on is flexibility and sort of first to ID that I'm a Gen Xer. And sort of with that Gen Xer, I, I bring a lot of um, my old mental model in terms of what work looks like. That, you know, sort of pre-technology, check your problem at the door, fo stay focused at work, and sort of delineate where work gets done. Um, and I have a lot of privilege in my status. And, and I have to say that before I go in to talk about flexibility and to your earlier remarks, Let's focus on knowledge workers and, and those that um, had the opportunity to stay home during the pandemic or were already home and um, you know, sort of focus there for a minute. It, you know, it was in that space that we all had to go above and beyond in those early months of work and we had to um, do outsized performance to make sure that our organizations could pivot at, you know, wherever we were on that journey to be able to, to stay producti productive. Um, what um, has come out is that the workers are saying, I don't want to go back. When I look at, at what I'm doing now and that work-life integration, it's not about balance. Balance is a false, it's a false um, goal that we have integrated our lives. And uh, you know, I'd almost want to show a hands of like, who before only did their medical appointments or missed their school, child's school activity because it was during the work day? And I suspect that anybody that's in my demographic did. <laughs> And maybe, maybe different demographics did. Um, but now the lines have been blurred, and we don't, we don't want to miss those opportunities. And it's more accessible for us to, to tap out for 30 minutes or an hour. And as a leader, your ability to, to, to honor and support that and create spaces and demonstrate humanity in that is really powerful. Um, and so I know that flexibility feels like a dirty word right now, especially when I think about all that you all are, are navigating, but it's vital to think about it. Um, think about the demand for agency employees are looking for, but also not just to look at the workplace where work gets done as the only arm of flexibility. What I just mentioned about work hours is another pivotal thing to consider and being um, flexible in that space, and also work styles. Um, you know, creating spaces for people to focus for certain periods of time and having no meeting Thursdays or um, uh, other elements like that. I think what was interesting to me, Brie, on this slide was this sort of redefining what a career is. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about how employees are approaching their career? Yeah, so it, it's really interesting because I think 
that the younger generations, millennials, zillennials now, uh, they don't see companies, excuse me, <clears throat> as, you know, I'm gonna spend 20, 30, 40 years at this company. This isn't about stability for me or job security necessarily. That's not their immediate priority. It's more about a collection of experiences and skill sets that they can gain and using that job as a stepping stone to their next career opportunity. And so I think if employers begin to you know, understand that mind shift and really almost position themselves in the marketplace towards that employee proposition, that employee value proposition, then they can really connect with some of these younger generations looking for, in particular, skill development, <coughs> coaching opportunities. Um, so we, we refer to it as VXC, so the value proposition in the marketplace, what's your brand perception, what's your offerings, and then what is the employee experience when they actually join the company, and that leads to the E, the engagement levels. So if there's a big disconnect between the two, then you're gonna have really low levels of engagement. So I think leaning into that skills and development and career pathing is very relevant right now. And to me, it feels like a lot of organizations have historically said we want to be a destination for talent. And I think there's sort of some problematic implications around this destination concept, which implies endpoint and can create some cultural reasons why we're not consistently investing once we get people in the door, right? Mm -hmm. So it almost sounds like places need to think about how to be a great place to be from in the market so that when um, your organization's name appears on a resume, they're more likely to get that interview, get that next thing that they want to do, and then that's actually the better way to think about employer brand. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think, um, you know, these are non-monetary benefits that the younger generations are perceiving. And, um, you know, you do see two years, I mean, Amy, I'm sure you know much more about this than me, but two years, three years on resumes is very typical, and it's about what skill sets that they've developed during that short amount of time. Yeah, and I think the other part of that is we're gonna have to adjust our mindset as hirers, because I think historically, when you see two or three year stints on a resume, you, you, you wonder if this person is, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a chronic job hopper, if they're not able to be successful. I think what we're saying is that this is their, these are their choices, right? This is the new normal, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, Amy, there was recently some news about the Department of Labor's sort of um, pro productivity numbers, and it seems to kind of remind me of that third bullet here around um, sort of that employees are overwhelmed by bureaucracy and by meetings and all of these things, right? And that it's making it hard to maybe feel like your work is productive. Can you talk a little more about how do we help employees there? Absolutely, and I think I saw it's 5% down or nearly 5% yeah. down in productivity. And you know, I would ask you to interrogate your own work processes and your own work styles and what's shifted for you. And I think the first one we might think about is the percentage of time we're spending in meetings. And um, why is that? Um, is it because we're not in an office together and we're now hybrid or, or fully remote? And it becomes more formal to share information as opposed to informal through that water cooler or sort of making a visual ID of somebody in the building and just trying to solve a problem um, you know, serendipitously um, as opposed to structure. Um, some of it is the length of the meetings, right? We used to have to have passing time when we moved from meeting to meeting to be able to um, decompress, you know, get a, you know, get a drink, and you had five minutes sort of to, to move between. We can build that into our systems today. You know, the, the re recent guidance is to make hour-long meetings 50 minutes and make 30 minutes meetings 20. And for those of you on pro pl platforms like Microsoft, there's no reason you can't have it automatically built into your systems. Ours are right now defaulted for 25 and 55 to create some spaces. Um, the other thing I'd like to make sure to spend a few moments talking about is the impact of the team. All, the research shows that the intact team stayed connected, that their sense of um, purpose and alignment and goals were really strong and stayed strong through the pandemic. Think about where you spent your time as a leader. Think about where you might have spent your time as a worker. But now, you know, sort of take it your lens out one and think about the teams that you do work with. Are you investing that time, whether or not it's you know, leveraging office hours or sort of starting a meeting and asking yourself, who's not in this room that should be here? Who are the other decision makers? Who's impacted by this decision? And making sure to spend some time in that space um, 
And then finally, if you're a leader, helping an employee understand purpose, why their job matters, how it contributes to the, to the bottom line. Even an accounts playable clerk makes a difference in working capital if they're doing their job really well. Yeah, I think it's um, easy for, especially you know, HR, finance, IT, to sort of get really into the weeds of what we're doing process-wise and not be able to connect it. Can you talk a little more about what conversations should a manager be having um, with their, their folks to help connect the dots? Thank you. So um, their ability to see the big picture and understand their work in a value chain and understand who are their partners, who are their clients, and how their work impacts others so that you understand the handoff. You don't just do something and stick it in a hole, in a black hole, and off it goes, but understanding and building rapport and relationships. The research is really clear that when a personal connection has been made between you know, two different workers of different groups, it significantly impacts how work gets done between them because they have a rapport, they have a connection. They're not just some name that receives the body, product of their work, but they're somebody that they can have a relationship with. And so, you know, there's some easy sort of tips around take the time to meet, you know, do virtual coffees, or, um, you know, have a, um, a team building activity, even if it's virtual with the different groups so they can build rapport. Um, there's also just a personal sort of expectation. I always say if it's taking me more than two emails, I gotta pick up the phone. If I'm IMing for more than three, three, three back and forth, I need to pick up the phone. Um, and just setting those expectations and, and, and sh talking about openly as a leader to your team. I think at the start of this slide, I said the gap between employers and yeah. employees is widening, right? Um, how is this indicative of sort of this redefining of employment, Brie? I mean, you've seen this across a number of, of companies, right? But is this sort of foundational to how we think about work in the future? <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I think so. You know, the, again, going back to what is the concept of work and how do we perceive work going forward? And I think companies more so now should start thinking about what are the critical skill sets that we need in my organization when, then rather than what are the critical roles that I need today. Um, you know, Amy, you mentioned, hey, there's uh, someone who quit, we need to backfill immediately. Rather than do that, think about what are the skills that I'm gonna need in the next one year, two year, um, two years. You know, uh, in finance in particular, shared service, sometimes a dirty word, but as we all know, we need to start, you know, globally standardizing our processes. There's a lot of, you know, back-end processes like reconciliations, billings that are automated. You know, most progressive companies are automating all of that. And rather than, again, communicating to your companies that this is going to be either offshore, outsourced, whatever, um, start thinking about the value-adding roles that they will be transitioned into in the next one to two years and start building those learning and development programs for them so that by the time that you're ready to transition, they're already upskilled because that's a more cost-effective way for you and you keep and retain your high potential employees. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned at the top that we've got five generations in the workforce. 50% um, of jobs are held by people over 50. Um, some of these items, I think, sometimes get tagged to the new joiners to the workforce. But Amy, would you say everyone, some people? Um, how do these apply across that, that sort of that career spectrum from the beginning to the end of a career? I think they all apply to every generation. And what's interesting is when I talk to other Gen Xers about their understanding of work, especially in the US, they're looking to that next generation and saying, thank you. Thank you for helping to create the permission for us to put work in the right space of our lives, that it, it, is, it has a vital role to serve, but it's not the only role in our lives. Um, I also think it's important to think about um, that we're not going back. I, I told um, Christine before we came to the session, think about it in terms of decades. In the late 1990s, the IT teams had their day. Y2K and all that, you know, all that we had to do, and then you think about the investment and the outsized investment in technology. You, you fast forward to 2008 and the financial crisis, and finance had their day. And 2020 has, has, has informed us that we can't go back on, um, on that, that employee value prop and that human experience, and, and we shouldn't want to go back. We need to take it forward, and what are the lessons learned, 
and what do we take into this next, these next, you know, next decades of work together? I, I just want to add on that. I think that nowadays when people are leaving and searching for their next employer, I think that's actually what they look for is probably their top yeah. category or criteria. I think it's how do they treat employees, what's their brand perception in the marketplace. You know, there's definitely companies out there that have very negative, um, especially right now with the massive layoffs, how did they, you know, maybe they do have to make those decisions, but how did they go about it and what it was it in a very humanistic way in which they let people go? Um, and, you know, what are their benefits in terms of maternity, paternity, et cetera? Those are, those are very um, in-demand things right now for workers. Good, thank you. I know we talked about that KPMG has done sort of a number of studies and a few stats on the screen here. Um, we won't go through each of them, but I'm curious, Bree, which of these sort of resonate most with your clients? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, I've been harping on about skills, um, as you all have heard, but I think, you know, in finance in particular, um, we, we talk about automation, automation of processes, and so I think you start thinking about um, as those uh, processes are automated, there's a lot more data and information being thrown at you. I mean, right now we're in a period where it's information overload, especially in remote and hybrid situations. We're getting emails, we're getting data thrown at us, so we need to think about how do we upskill our employees in finance so that they are able to take that data, visualize that data, and tell a story, an insightful story, um, and interrogate the data. We were talking about um, the very underappreciated skill of uh, data scientists, so creating hypotheses with the data and interrogating that data. And then, you know, we're, we've been talking for a while now about strategic business partnering. So in finance, it's more than that. It's about how do we take the data that we're using to actually formulate um, hypotheses and partner with them to improve their businesses. And I think what stands out to me, Amy, is that we're asking employees to take on a lot of change at a time when perhaps they've already been through a lot in the last couple of years. I see some stats about well-being and mental health. How should we be thinking about that? Thank you, and I'm, I'm probably gonna pick up on Bree's uh, prior remarks. This idea of seeing the whole person and that you're not just hiring a, a robot to come in from nine to five and complete a set of activities, but that person brings all of their challenges that they were experiencing outside of the work into the, into the workplace. And when you think about the, the isolation, the fatigue, you know, the additional burden for childcare and elder care that have been placed on, on everyone, but in particular, you know, women in the workplace, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do differently? And as a leader, I would just encourage you to think about, have you created psychological safety with your employees that they can speak to you openly about the challenges that are impacting their productivity? Um, because oftentimes you can uncover something that's very easy to remedy, but in the absence of uncovering it and, and working together for solution, that person is more than likely thinking about exiting the workplace, your workplace, or even the workforce altogether as opposed to understanding it's not a binary decision, that there's, there's something else that we could be doing to create those spaces, whether or not it's putting a person in what I call the off-ramp, where they might slow their career or slow their role down, or they just need some additional support. And you know, we've been um, very engaged not only with our EAP, but we've introduced um, like meditation and the Calm app, we're offering it to our employees, and the amount of excitement over this app that was coming in sort of really stunned me. But recognizing that, that mental acuity and mental fitness is vital and how we can together that do it is really important. One of the things that Shane said this morning was, you know, when he started out in his basketball career, that, that they had been doing sort of data analytics in baseball for a long time, right? We've all seen Moneyball, we all know, right? But that then they started introducing the same skill set within basketball. I think we're at the front end of seeing that type of analytics come to workforce and come to talent. And I, I see a lot of stats up here that are more about sort of what are the perceptions of leaders, but I'm wondering where are we going in terms of using data to really understand our workforces in organizations? I mean, I think we're just going back to the analogy of finance to HR, I would say as a function, we're significantly behind finance and our ability to have 
meaningful data sets that are measurable and actionable. And ideally, we want to move to a place where we have predictive insights mm -hmm. that we can use that information to predict when a, a group of workers or an individual worker is likely to, to leave. Um, but in the meantime, we have to ba build basic competencies around our current experiences and then just not be okay with it, right? We talked about the cost of turnover. And you know, at, at Kelly, we looked at ours and said, it's probably a $100 million problem. That if we, if, we could, if we could solve the unwanted turnover, especially year one, and I think you told me it's day 122? Yep. Day 122 turnover, um, that we would significantly improve uh, the productivity of the organization and see you know, sort of significant financial outcomes. Yeah, we were, Amy and I were speaking earlier about this idea that almost all organizations have sort of a, a date, a fall off date where you have high turnover when you bring someone in. It wasn't what they expected. There's been some misalignment. We'll touch on that later. But if you can get employees through that critical period, you can typically keep them for three, five, seven years um, at minimum. And so this idea, like this is a really simple data exercise, right? To think about when does turnover happen for us in our own organizations? Where does it happen? And can we create a lot of structure around that time period where that turnover happens? And um, as, as individual managers, you can, you can do this in your own teams, right? To say, hey, if we know the first 120 days are critical, how are we plotting that literally day by day to make sure there are key interactions, there are connection points, there are um, some, some broad programs in place to support it. Another stat that Amy, you and I have talked about is that turnover um, within manufacturing sites is um, three times lower if the employee believes their plant manager knows their name. Does the plant manager have to know their name? No. But does the employee have to believe they do? Yes. <laughs> so we would give the plant manager on their daily walks throughout the plant lists of new, new names um, and they, where they were working. And they would go and greet the employee by name and say, I know you're new. How's it going? What do you need? And the turnover for those people that they connected with directly by name was much lower than if they just connected without a name or if they didn't connect at all. And so it's not about these huge, big interventions, right? It's just these moments, these touch points that actually drive a lot of value. Yeah, and I, I just want to add to that. I, you know, again, we talk about the moments that matter across the employee life cycle, and it really is sometimes the smallest um, things that have the biggest impact. And I was talking with a leader recently, and he said, you know, I just don't have time to reach out to every single one of my direct reports. I don't have time to reach out to every one of my team members. And he said, so sometimes, you know, all it takes is a text, and it's so true. I mean. It, you know, if someone who has 200 employees, but if someone, if that leader shoots off a text to check in and say, how are you? Or, you know, I heard you were sick. Are you feeling better? That's very impactful. And it, it shows you that someone's caring or thinking about you. And um, so it's, again, it's those small moments that matter that really help retain employees. Yeah, that being seen, sorry. Being seen. I was going to say, how important is it that, uh, that you feel like your manager really cares about your development, your experience? It's vital and it's non-negotiable. In that role of the leader, what is it, 75% of most organizational expenses today are people, right? It used to be capital, and, you know, and now it's, it's people. And people leaders need to understand the vital role that they play. And if it's not natural, build the structures and system in place with nudges yeah. and reminders. You know, I, I have a reminder calendar appointment every Friday morning that reminds me to send recognition and appreciation every Friday morning. Mm. Um, sometimes leaders who don't aren't good at it put like, you know, sort of reminders every day, like five, like five quarters in the right pocket, like in reaching out and being intentional about creating that connection. Because being seen matters. Um, mm. It absolutely matters. That's great. So when you think about, we focus so much on hiring. I hear it all the time. How can I hire more people? How can I get more people? But this whole conversation has been focused on the whole life cycle, right? So it's really critical that we not get out of this, okay, if we can just get them in the door, we're gonna be fine, right? It needs to go past that. And so, um, you know, when we think about this life cycle, I'm curious, Amy, workforce planning, how do you think about not just planning for what you're gonna need, but then how do you share that or what, what do you do with that information? Thank you. I would, I would encourage any of you that are finance partners supporting a business. I, I know we're not data people, we're not the numbers people yet. We're working on it. 
but make sure your HR partner is your best friend at work. You sit on a whole lot of information around business growth and business contraction. You have a lot of really great information around the cost, departmental cost around labor. And sometimes we need to, we need to be in, in deep partnership of that so that HR has that lens and it's simple workforce planning. I know for many people they think of workforce planning in this complicated strategic five year. It doesn't have to be. It can be incredibly simple of understanding the shifts in the business conditions, understanding the work, you know, the workforce cost changes, and then partnering together in that space. And so I always refer to the business leader, the finance leader, and the HR leader needs to be in a really strong connected perspective, and in particular that finance and HR. Um, and working together to make sure that when you're doing annual business planning and budget planning that you are connected closely with with the HR team to know what are the critical skills for the next uh, the next year or three what are we doing in terms of protecting and upscaling our existing workforce and what are we doing about being in a position to go by if that's what we need to do and once you know what you need in terms of skills how do you go get that free how do you go mm -hmm. find that that talent how do, you, how do you acquire the talent? Well, I think, do you acquire it all? Or how, I mean, how do you think yeah. about it, right? Yeah, I, I, and it's more now about sourcing and mm -hmm. almost creating your own pipeline. So, I mean, very common question right now with companies is uh, we're just not seeing the interest when we post jobs. They're sitting there on job sites for months and, and no one's responding and why is that you know part of it might be it's not the right profile but part of it might be that you're not um you know thinking about the qualifications and the skill sets in the right way so are there you know the minimum qualifications can some of those be eliminated um there's a big conversation right now about how do we increase diversity and equity and inclusion um, and part of that is eliminating some of those traditional mandatory qualifications and maybe supplementing that with in-house learning and development. Um, also, think about geography. So are there areas of the country, now that we're working more remote, where you traditionally haven't sourced talent from? Can you create your own talent pipeline by partnering with local communities or high schools and um, creating internship programs there, again, to increase diversity, but then also so that you create that pipeline, build that pipeline for yourself so that you see that paying off in the next five, 10 years so that you don't have to worry about it. Can I, can I double click yeah. on that? Um, what you said is really powerful and you ran through it in a number of pieces, but that barrier breaking mm -hmm. and you know, really looking at, do we, does this role need a college degree? Mm -hmm. Or can you pull back and say, let's reconstruct the roles in such a way that we can create a space for a recent high school grad who wants to come in and learn the, the work and you know, sort of create that pipeline of future, future accountants or sort of fill in the blank. And it's really important. And it does, it is the catalyst for, for um, DE&I measures and in particular getting equity at work. Absolutely, and start thinking about transferable skills. So again, in the next two to three years, are, is your finance organization going to transform? Because maybe you might need those design thinking skills or consulting type uh, org transformation skills that you can source from different traditional roles that you wouldn't have considered in the past. I heard someone say about DEI recently that it used to be about access and now it's more about awareness that, that a lot of young folks don't necessarily know, especially in diverse areas, about the types of careers that might exist within accounting and finance. Mm. Sounds like you're saying that could be true. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, no offense to the accountants in the room, but you know, be a young person today and, and, and ask me whether or not, answer whether or not you think that's a, that's a choice one of what they're thinking about. You have to create a space where accounting is cool and fun, and how do you do that is getting access and information and giving them the opportunity before they go pursue that four degree, year degree or while they're in education trying to discern. Mm -hmm. And just working with your local universities, you know, HBCUs are awesome, but they're not always accessible for us. And so working in your local um, underrepresented universities is a great way to, to, get, to get that access. It strikes me that when you're hiring, which you, just, you know, getting people excited about what's possible in a role is a big part of it. We want folks to be excited to join our organizations, but we also have to be realistic about what the job is. Can you talk a little bit about what happens when you sort of have a gap there, Amy? Absolutely. I think it's incumbent on each of us, whether or not we're the hiring leader 
or were participating in the interview process to set a realistic job preview. If you, if you set a false expectation about what, what it looks like, you're going to um, quickly, um, the person's gonna come in and be in a position where they're just gonna leave, right? That's not, it's not what they, you said it was gonna be, it's not what I wanted it to be, and this isn't fit for me. And you know, back to Bree's point of, I'm not looking for that 30-year job, I'm looking to build my skills, to build, build networking, and if it's too hard to get work done or if the culture isn't welcoming, then I, I am going to be more incentivized to leave. And so it's not only um, and it's not only that, but it's also then your earlier point about making sure you're creating a buddy, a workplace buddy. And I love the buddy program because mm -hmm. you know individuals who think they want to be a people leader, it's a great opportunity for them to practice those you know those leader skills, and um, they're invested then in the, in that development and, and retention. Absolutely. And Bree, earlier you mentioned kind of developmental opportunities as a non-monetary incentive is what you said earlier. Yeah. Can you um, talk a little bit about what is learning, well, how should organizations think about learning and development nowadays? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think that, you know, it's a differentiator for companies. I think if you really invest, it's, it's a unique value proposition. We're helping companies create finance academies, almost like a finance boot camp. And again, partnering with local communities, local high schoolers, People who haven't really had an introduction to finance skill sets before, um, you know, think about sort of five, ten years ago, um, before IT was the sexy industry to be in. Um, they started those programs like Girls Who Code or um, other kind of programs targeted at university or high school age. There's no reason why there can't be the same thing, but in finance to connect um, future talent to existing companies. And how does that fit with what you talked about earlier around digital literacy and data visualization? Are those sort of becoming cornerstones of learning programs as well? I think so. I think we're just starting to see it now. I think that companies are probably just at the tip of, of realizing the potential for those skill sets. And one of the interesting um, things that we've been looking at within the job posting data sets, which are huge, is that the ROI for taking your current employee and adding those skills mm. versus hiring someone in the market who already has, say, Tableau or Power BI experience, um, it, it's, it's two and three times the incremental cost, right? So I think all of us, um, you know, sort of numbers-minded folks in the room are you know, doing the math on that, the ability, the investment there, the cost to provide the training really pays off then. Um, I wanna ask about performance, because we've seen um, some organizations, I'll say, take some different approaches. And you've seen some large organizations sort of um, have public fallout around how they've awarded bonuses, let's say, that it wasn't clear you know, what performance was or, or what was expected. I think this is a tough area a lot of companies are navigating. What's the right direction on this? Um, so it's complicated. Yeah. Ratings are complicated. Yeah. You know, getting a label is complicated. <laughs> um, but being clear as a leader to understand, to be in a position to articulate to an employee what good looks like, helping them to set, set sprints around their, you know, their next set of goals, and then keeping those conversations on a regular cadence so that you're addressing on a weekly basis. I always think about like a little bit of a, um, a, a chart for your heart rate chart, right? Like it's just, it just needs to be a drumbeat of regular connections and then every you know, quarter, three, three months, pulling up and saying, as I look back, here's what I see. As I look ahead, here's what I'm thinking about. Um, you know, my shorthand for all leaders is you need to see yourself as a coach. It is not your responsibility to, to create the, the development plan for employees. It is your, your, your responsibility to create the space. And I think about those, those, those sort of the up conversations looking at just a little bit in the rearview mirror, but a lot looking forward. And in that looking forward, breaking down career aspirations and interests of the employee and making sure you understand what that is, and then thinking about the associated development plan and how can you help be a coach and you know, really setting that expectation that employees own their careers. They're, they're doing it anyways, right? That, that, but making sure that, that I'm here to help you achieve. I'll open up my network, I'll create access points, I'll look for experiences and side hustles. If you think about the 70-20-10 model of if you're crushing your day job and at 70%, if you've got time and interest in, de in developing skills or getting ready for the workforce of the future, then I'll create it for you. Yeah. There's, there's something I wanted to add to around um, rewards and benefits. So, um, you know, tr obviously traditional financial bonus, et cetera, fine. 
But then when you think about non-monetary related rewards, we really want to dig into that data. And I think finance can be a really good partner for HR because there is so much data and there's so much data that we haven't explored in terms of what's the cost benefit analysis. So there's companies out there, like we partner with Pecon, which is you know, a listening type of uh, platform or software and really digging into employee sentiments as it relates to reward and recognition. And sometimes, again, it's, uh, you know, you'll hear this throughout our conversation, but it's small moments that matter that have a very big positive impact. So there was a case where this company had traditionally provided around the holidays a um, meal package for employees. So, you know, turkey, ham, whatever, in a box. And cost-saving measure, they decided to take it away one year probably very small cost savings, but it was a very negative reaction from employees that much outweighed the cost that they did save. And so looking at employee sentiment and what's really impactful, because something small like a Christmas turkey or ham um, can actually you know, create a lot of positive impact and value and loyalty with, uh, with your employees. Yeah. So picking up from there, I would just say, be mindful of finance as you're looking at you know, reducing benefits or offerings. It does matter, but the flip side is we need to be really sensitive about what we're adding into the environment. Oh. And the research is, use the word experimenting. People understand when you say, we're gonna try this, and then we're gonna evaluate it to understand whether or not it had the impact we're looking for and if it makes sense for you. And so think about more experimentation in the work. We don't have to have it all figured out. We can work together and, and try it. So that way you're not setting the expectation That's that right. it's in the package so when you take it away, it's a That's terrible right. thing. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, we want to take some questions from the audience. I know, Joe, you had the <laughs> online participation and then audience as well. We do have some questions coming in, um, but okay. if anyone in the room wants to go first, please do. <clears throat> One of the new rules and regulations around uh, wage transparency, where you have to post ranges to pay on where the role is or which state, do you anticipate that that will drive up or increase the number of employees that are asking for increases in their wage based on the postings? A hundred percent. I think it'll, it will um, be incumbent on leaders to be in a position to answer the question and to be able to have the right career conversation. Because if a person's compensation is at the right position and they see the full range of the role, um, and you have to be in a position to be able to say, hey, if, if you're interested in, this is the steps that we need to get you to build the skills or to demonstrate the performance of, or if you have other interests, like how do we get you onto a different career path? And so I, I really, I, in my mind, it goes back to that leader, that leader capability to, to um, have those conversations. Yeah, I agree. I, I think we've seen, you know, in Colorado, some of the ranges have been so big that they actually, companies figuring, well, I'll give a range, and then that way I can still hire the way I would have otherwise and calibrate to the candidate. But it's created exactly what you've described, which is people in that role saying, well, why am I not paid at the top end of this range? Um, and so you absolutely have to be prepared with it, um, especially, I would say, you know, um, culturally in some of the generations that are on the beginning part of their career, there's a much more op open, um, perspective about sharing compensation information, whether it's within a company or across companies, they are talking to each other and they know how much each other makes and they know what your benefits are. Um, and so you have to be prepared, whether it's from the job postings or through their own networks, that they have a lot more data than employees have ever had in the past about what roles are worth and what they think they should be paid. There's entire platforms now just devoted yeah. to yeah. that, right? There's, yeah. I don't know, Fishbowl, um, yeah. Glassdoor, right? So I think it's only going to get more transparent. Mm -hmm. And I think companies should get ahead of that. So start thinking about, as you're creating a role, what, what should be the appropriate cost? Because it's going to be out there. Yeah, and what are the, what are the in the range, mm. what drives the high end versus the low end? So you can start to talk to people about incremental skills and developmental items. So it's more productive than just, I want x-rays, you can't have x-rays, right? Um, having a conversation that instead says, you could have that raise if you could build this skill set is much more, it's, it's much more investment focused on the employee and I think it's more productive mm. um, across the board. Mm. So one of the questions we got 
was around the degree requirements and how that would apply to finance and accounting roles and if you removed that requirement. Yeah, I talk to a lot of finance leaders who say, I get you're doing that for software engineers and that's cute, but it's never gonna fly in finance. Um, Amy, you talked a little bit about sort of restructuring jobs. Do so you wanna share a little more there? Yeah. The idea of looking at what the work is and you know, so I think it might be my Six Sigma training years ago, like that idea of putting the work in the right cost channel, this idea that you know, the highest and most important work should go to your highest paid team. And you know, really looking at it to say, okay, yes, we do need certified you know, public accountants to do this body of work, but there are tasks and um, you, know, you talked about shared services and activities that feed that system. And so pulling back and looking at it um, and, and asking yourself, can we, can we give that CPA the most complicated you know, sort of CPA level work? And then how do you break the tasks down and look differently at it so you can create those pipelines? Um, and it's, it's vital, for, especially in the DE&I space, and also that, that worker attraction, right? We saw that there's a certain percentage of workers that are, are not coming back, or just by the size of our populations aren't available. So we have to think differently. All right, another one. Uh, <laughs> this is actually around flexibility um, in the finance and accounting role. I think typically accountants work each month end, quarter end, year end. How, how, do, you, how do you create flexibility in that setting? Yeah, yeah so, so recognizing that there are points in time that are going to be heavier lifts, especially for everyone in this room, probably month end, quarter end, year end, depending on um, your organization. And I'm curious, Amy, you talked about flexibility not just in workplace, but work hours and work style. How should um, our friends in finance think about this in the construct of their work? It's a great opportunity to look at those milestones, those month, quarter, and year end closes as needing incremental work, you know, workers. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't offer Kelly as a potential solution for you, but you have those solutions within. <laughs> I, but you have those solutions in your workplace today. Who's retired out of your department? Who are workers that are thinking about leaving your organizations that might stay if you said, hey, listen, two weeks a month you can go part time, and two weeks a month I need you full time. Um, how do you look at the process and say, how do we automate and standardize some of the processes to reduce that friction point or that heavy burden? Do you have to be in the building for those closes? Or can you be six hours in the building, go home, put the kids to bed, have dinner, and then log back on and finish? But what amount of flexibility, you know, who does the work, and then how the work gets done, and then really looking at your process. I, you know, I, I know in my team, we do annual process work, and we act like it's the first time we do it every year. <laughs> like, it is not, it's the same thing. We need a good project plan, we need a good process, you know, project discipline, we need to have really good training around it, and then we need to execute in the most efficient and effective way. And is that a potential place then to look to automation? Absolutely. Okay. Just wanted to add to that. So <clears throat> I think two things that I want to add. One is flex, but with purpose. We have that concept at KPMG, and we encourage our clients to explore that as well. So it doesn't have to be every time. It doesn't have to be a binary situation where you must do this. It can be you know, okay, you might have to work 16 hours today, but it's okay if you need to go drop your kids off at soccer from two to three or whatever it is. Um, and I think it's about secondary, having those personal connections and personal conversations because it's not one size fits all. It's not one policy for everyone. I think you need to talk to your team and find out what's their situation at home. Do, are they caring for an elderly family member where they would need to step out for an hour. Um, and again, you know, I think it's, yes, looking at it as a whole, but then making individual decisions and having those human connections and human conversations to find out where they can flex and what works for your business. Yeah, and, and set down the word fair. You know, I, I know for you know, my early years in manufacturing, you didn't want to be flexible because you perceived as being unfair. And I think we need to really think about equitability and equitable you know, work conditions and recognizing that we're all in different places and what we need um, is going to be different. I wanna pick up on something you said about you know, potentially maybe you have some retirees who might wanna come back part-time and 
we heard about um, such a large percent of the workforce being over age 50. Um, there's some interesting stats around um, reskilling um, people who are closer to the end of the career than the beginning, and I think um, it ties to what you said, Bree, around making assumptions, right? So 67% um, of people over age 50 would like to be taught a new skill by their employer. They're open to it, they want to learn but only 20% have actually been offered an option to learn a new skill. So are we overlooking some folks in our workforce who might be able to fill some of these skills and, and certainly have the knowledge to, to help us here? Yeah, I think so, and, and we encourage our clients to um, create, we call them personas, so looking at employee populations by segment. So is there um, a unique benefit or offering that would be tailored to your aging population or your more tenured employees that would really add a lot of value for them and that would help upskill them and um, help retain them proactively. And the data exists, right? Is, is, if people are downloading a software like Power BI onto their desktop, <laughs> it's a great opportunity to send some training materials to say, hey, we, we, you know, IT knows who downloaded some new, some new software. Pairing them with somebody to say, hey, on your team, Sally is an expert at Power BI. You know, you know, encourage, you know, encourage that. You know, MOOCs, you know, um, YouTube. I, you know, the first time, we, you know, my mentor, my mentee talked to me about using YouTube to solve challenges about 10 years ago. I'm like, really? Yeah, you can use YouTube to go, you know, figure out how to complete that task. Yeah. We need, you know, being, being um, curious and then being open to, and then to your point, we need that workforce to be, to be productive. Right. Uh, one question from uh, one of our virtual attendees. I agree that we should not be going back to pre-pandemic situation. Never, nevertheless, we do see many leaders struggle with keeping the team engaged, ensuring proper development of talent, which happens often through on-site coaching and mentoring, listening into conversations of leaders and watching their behavior. Working virtually reduces significantly these possibilities to learn and develop. What can leaders do to ensure the continued development in a more virtual working environment? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'll acknowledge that I think we've all seen those challenges. And we also see most organizations settling around something like a 3-2 or a 2-3, where so three days in the office, two days um, somewhere else, uh, or Two, two days in the office, three somewhere else. So we're seeing this sort of gravitation towards that, maybe that model. But I think the broader question is once we sort of get to, okay, this is what physically where we're going to be working, how do we create um, in those times when we are together a really you know, sort of impactful experience um, so that it's, it's one worth being there for our workers and two, that we're creating culture and development uh, in that setting. And so as you're thinking about that, you know, some easy nudges that you can think about is start every meeting with a little bit of a, of a social, non-business non you know, question. You know, Brene Brown says, ask you know, sort of two words, how are you? Um, I, you know, I started at Kelly in the sixth month of the pandemic. It took me two years to get my team in person. But I started every meeting with a personal connection. And so by the time we got to know, we, we got to be in person, we, we had each other's backs. We were taking care of each other. And so I think there are um, small actions that you can use. Um, and just to stay on that two word, it was empowering for me. It was really impactful for me to ask those questions because one week I asked, okay, two words, how are you doing? And everybody was overwhelmed, exhausted, frustrated. And I, and I said, stop, okay, we're gonna stop, we're gonna stop the show and we're gonna figure out what we're gonna do different. And so we had to pull back and say, we're gonna stop doing this, we're gonna focus on this. Team, you're gonna go help over here. And it really created that space for, when you don't see somebody all, every day in person, you need to have other prompts to connect with them. And I think leaders, Bree, have been sort of clear on why they want people to come back to the workplace, right? Yeah. But do employees see the same value or do we need to articulate it somehow to them? It's like you're reading my mind. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I, you know, the reality is we all work in a business, 
right? And the business sometimes needs to have people in person. And I think we've been operating for a long time. Many companies that I work with, they're only just now going back and reassessing the policies that they made at the beginning of the pandemic that allowed for a lot of flexibility that just don't make sense anymore because they're not seeing the same levels of productivity. And so I think it's about transparency and communication saying, you know, 75% of the time you can work remote and we're happy to support that. But ultimately for these specific business processes or these activities or these moments of, of the month, we need to be in person together to get things done. Because there's just, you know, there's workshops, there's business alignment that, you know, you just can't get the same consensus or outputs or outcomes. And I think it's about communicating very clearly so that they do have those expectations aligned. Make the workplace a destination, not an obligation. Yeah, right? You that. know, when you're coming to the office, are you collaborating? Are you connecting? Are you celebrating? Or are you just spending the whole day on Zoom calls? Yes. And, you know, the team needs to work together to say, okay, when we're in the office these days, we're going to be in person and we're going to collaborate and connect and roll up our sleeves because there is nothing better than that energy of being in a room together and solving a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm just having, you know, sort of team meetings with, with the team's virtual anyways, like it doesn't feel so great to drive the 30 minutes to the office and have to do the same thing I could have done at home. No. A, co a company that I once worked for um, had a feature in Outlook where as you added attendees, it would calculate the cost yeah. of the meeting. And so suddenly if you get, it was amazing. So suddenly you have 20 leaders in the room and it was like over a million dollars and you're like, okay, maybe Never we don't mind. need Never this mind. meeting. Yeah, let me rethink this agenda. So um, make it purposeful when you do and clearly communicate that. Well, I want to thank you, Amy and Bree, for being here today, for sharing your perspectives. Thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, we'll end this session here, but um, welcoming Pat Ryan back to the stage, Patrick Ryan, to take us into our next segment. Thank you all. Appreciate it.